please welcome Annie Duflo. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so I know it's late in the afternoon. Are you all awake? Great, because I have a question for you. I'm going to start with a question, if my slides come up. Is it me? Oh, yeah. Here you go. So let me start with a question, like I said. Let's say you like oranges and you have one dollar. Would you rather buy the one orange on the left, raise the left hand, or the four oranges on the right, raise the right hand? And it's not a trick question. Great. I think we are in consensus here, which is good. Why would you buy less if you can get more for the same amount of money, right? But the decision is not always that simple. So let's say now that you would like to um, uh, fund a program that aims to uh, increase attendance in school. So you'd like to donate $100 to an organization that, that has this purpose. Uh, sc school absenteeism is a big problem in a lot of low-income countries. On any given day, 30% of kids are not in school. So to address this problem, would you rather fund a program that distributes school uniforms because you think that they don't go to school because they, don't, they can't afford the appropriate clothes? Uh, or would you rather give your $100 to a school-based deworming program? The idea is that uh, children often don't go to school because they are sick and often they are sick because they have intestinal worms. Left hand for the uniforms, right hand for the school-based deworming. The well, well informed audience. Um, anyway, here you cannot count what you're buying, right? Which are the additional years of schooling. And that's, that's the challenge. And yes, yet it, it really matters. So on this graph, you can see the number of additional years of schooling that you can get for $100. So with the school based um, uh, deworming program, you can get 14 children to attend school for one more year. With the uniforms program, which was also effective, uh, you can get one child to attend school for one more year, right? So the school-based deworming program was very effective, but also really cheap, which is why it's more cost-effective you know, here in the Kenyan context. So I'm not going to spend much more time on these programs for now, but there are really two key takeaways from this. One is that there can be a lot of variation in the amount of impact you can get for your dollar or in other words, returns on investment. The second takeaway is that it's not always obvious which ideas will be most cost effective, right? It requires precise measures of impact and precise measures of uh, cost. So that's the problem I'm going to uh, talk about today. So I'm going to tell you about uh, how the standards for evidence have been changing in the last sort of 10, 15 years in the international development space. Uh, then I'll give you some examples of uh, what we have learned um, by generating this evidence. And I'll talk about how this has translated into real changes sometimes. Uh, and I'll conclude with a, a few thoughts on what, what that means for, uh, for philanthropy. Um, so how have others tackle this problem. So in, in the for-profit sector, it's pretty common for companies like Intel, Google, and others to spend between like 10 and 20% of their budget on research and development to figure out which, what will have the highest returns on investment, right? And same with pharmaceutical companies who uh, run clinical trials to assess what medicines will be most, uh, most effective. But in the international development space, it's less than 1% of resources that get spent on research and development, whether it's to test new ideas or even to confirm whether existing ideas uh, work. And on any given year, there is approximately almost $150 billion of dollars that get spent on, on fighting poverty just by OECD countries. So it's really important that we figure out how to spend this, this money uh, in a cost-effective manner. And that is really uh, the reason why my organization, Innovations for Poverty Action, was, was created, uh, as well as many of our partner organizations who, who work in the space. So our goal, and that of our partners is, um, if you will, uh, is to be like an 
R&D unit for the international development field to inform decision makers about what works and what doesn't. And our goal is to do, is to do this as rigorously as in the medical field and to promote the use of evidence uh, as, it, as it goes. The way we work is that we partner with um, academics from various academic institutions and um, decision makers. So it could be non-profits, uh, we work with Samasos, for example, or it could be uh, governments. And together, researchers and practitioners identify issues faced by the poor. So it could be school absenteeism, it could be uh, low vaccination rates, uh, low farming investments, etc. And together they identify potential solutions um, and often they actually design new ones and then we rigorously test the effectiveness of these potential solutions to understand which ones will work best. And to do that we use uh, randomized control trials which is the same method that's been used now for several decades in the medical field to assess the effectiveness of medicines. And the way it works is that by randomly assigning participants to either a program group that will receive the intervention or more and to a comparison group that will not, this allows to disentangle the effect of the program from other factors like the passage of time, things change over time or interesting characteristics like motivation. Right? Um, so that's, um, that's what we do. When you buy a medicine, you expect that it has been tested rigorously. So our goal is really to uh, introduce the same standards of evidence in the international development space. And the good news is that in the last uh, 15 years, the, the body of evidence has, has really grown. So just at IPA, we have about 700 studies, either completed or ongoing ones, like across a number of, of issues but there are many other uh, players as well. And beyond that, beyond the actual generation of, of evidence through these studies, there is really a growing movement of evidence-driven philanthropy and international development um, actors. Uh, so for example, you know, the effective altruism movement really emphasizes the use of evidence in philanthropy. Uh, you probably know about GiveWell, that's an organization that identifies and then recommends um, evidence-based programs uh, for, for philanthropists, um, etc. And we heard about many examples today uh, as, as well. So this is exciting for us to be part of this movement and, and inform uh, this movement. So now let me give you a couple of examples of what we have learned um, from this evidence. And obviously there are many more. Um, so one, one thing that we have learned uh, is that common wisdom is not always true, and that's why it is important to evaluate. So I'll just give you one, one example. Um, there is a pretty common approach uh, in the governance space, which is to uh, organize uh, training workshops on democratic processes. So USAID, for example, spends millions of dollars on that type of programs. And the idea is that when you um, teach citizens about uh, the, the political process, uh, about, um, um, about the, the means of, um, of, of political participation, they, they will increase their participation and that will lead policymakers to be more uh, responsive and efficient, right? That's, so the idea is that it will increase bottom-ups accountability. So researchers with IPA um, tested, evaluated such a program in Peru um, in an area that has a lot of mining activities uh, going on. So it was a typical sort of workshop um, uh, program where citizens were educated on the participatory budgeting process, uh, they were educated on, on how to participate in the local um, political process. So for example, you know, they are allowed, citizens are allowed to recall mayors in, in this context. So they were taught about that, that kind of, of things. Well, it turns out that the program was actually quite effective in the sense that it did increase citizens' knowledge. But it seems that this knowledge actually led to being disillusioned 
about the process. And at the end of the day, the mayors, who were the main uh, political actors here, reduced their efforts and actually started spending less. Right? Um, so there are a number of interesting implications of that, and I won't, I won't get into it. And, and of course, this is one context. You know, this is the kind of thing that we need to test in other contexts as well. Uh, but still, this raises a lot of very interesting questions about an approach that seems to be widely accepted. Um, Another thing that we have learned is that simple things sometimes can go a really long way, uh, especially when you know, all people need is a little nudge to do what's, what's right for them. Right? Um, so um, this is actually a, a very uh, core concept behind um, uh, behavioral economics. Uh, so you may, you may be familiar with the work of Richard Thaler, who was awarded the last uh, economics Nobel Prize. Uh, and his Save More Tomorrow uh, program in the United States. So uh, the, the idea is to have employees uh, be by default enrolled into a savings program where they have to actively opt out of the program, as opposed to the contrary, where they would have to actively choose to be part of the savings program. Right? Either way, they have the right to, uh, to not save. But this was incredibly effective at getting people to save because they didn't have to think about it. Right? And that approach has been tested in various ways uh, uh, across the world. Uh, so just a simple nudge. Now in a completely different um, sort of area, uh, safe water. So you probably know that uh, diarrhea is one of the leading causes of uh, child mortality under five, and contaminated water is, it is at the root of, of that. So um, in Kenya, researchers uh, evaluated the impact of um, uh, installing chlorine dispensers next to community water sources. The program was incredibly effective, and not only because, um, cost effective, I should say, not only because it was much cheaper than distributing chlorine packs household to household, which was a fairly common approach, uh, but also because these chlorine dispensers, which was right next to the community, so community source, acted as a reminder, right? Because when you go to get your water, that's when you actually need the chlorine. And it was right there for, y for, for you to see, right? And that's really important, because for us, living in the developed world, there's so many things we don't have to think about. Like we don't have to think about putting chlorine in our water, right? But poor people have to think about so many things. So that kind of programs can be very powerful. So the usage of safe water increased sixfold uh, with this intervention. Uh, oops. I'm not going to show you the next slide because I want to make sure that you're still awake and have another vote. Um, so the, the next issue I'm going to talk about is uh, malaria. So we, we all know that um, insecticide-treated nets can save lives by protecting people against malaria, right? Now, there's been a big debate um, at some point around should insecticide-treated nets be given for free so that as many people as possible get them, or should they be charged for a fee? And the idea, the idea behind that is that when you charge something for a fee, people value it more, so they are more likely to use it. So, who votes for the free nets? Who votes for the fee? Well, we actually set up an experiment to answer these questions where some people got the bed nets for free and some people got it for a fee. Still very subsidized, actually. It turns out that even a small price, still extremely subsidized, dropped the demand quite sharply. And the women who got the bed nets for free were not likely to use it less. They were using it as often. So this is a very strong argument for free bed nets distribution. Very interesting study. OK, so you're probably thinking, OK, all, all, this is all really interesting. I'm sure this translates into wonderful academic papers. But so what? Well, the good news is that quite often, not always, and this is not automatic, but quite often, this research actually does translate into real changes. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back to the example that I talked about. So sticking to the bed nets example, a lot of prominent organizations were promoting charging fees for bed nets. 
uh, Population Services International, the WHO, etc. They actually changed their policy based on, on this research, and so did many other organizations. The school-based deworming program I talked about and the chlorine dispensers program I talked about are both being scaled by an organization called Evidence Action, which was created uh, with our help, actually, for the purpose of scaling evidence-based programs. And millions of um, individuals have been reached by, by these programs uh, now, especially the school-based deworming programs, which has been around for a while. Now, we also have seen some changes um, among governments. Uh, so an, uh, uh, a well-known example is that of Progresa in Mexico, and, and we didn't do this study. The, the Mexico um, Progresa program, which in between change names several times, is now called Prospera. This is a conditional cash transfer program where households get a little bit of cash um, under the condition that their children attend school. Um, the, the program was, was quite effective and was um, survived many administrations in Mexico, which is quite rare uh, in, in Mexico. <laughs> programs tend to change with new administrations. Not only that, it was scaled to 52 countries. Um, and probably for a number of reasons, but the fact that there was a randomized evaluation of this program done certainly contributed to the survival and the scale uh, of, of this program. Uh, and there are other examples as well that I won't get into. Um, okay, so let me just conclude with a few thoughts about what does this mean for uh, for philanthropy, and just um, summarize what I some of what I say. So ultimately, we are all trying to maximize a pretty simple formula, right? We need good ideas that work, uh, and these good ideas also need to be implemented well. Otherwise, good ideas are not, not useful. Now, as far as good ideas are concerned, there are many of them, and testing rigorously can help us figure out what works best. And testing rigorously can also help us figure out dif different ways to implement these good ideas. So the, the free or uh, distribution of bed nets is a good example of, of that. Right? It's a question around delivery of something we know uh, work. And small investments in testing can actually lead large-scale players to uh, scale evidence-based uh, solutions. Now, something else to remember, which comes out of, uh, of our and others' research, is that there is no one silver bullet. You know, there is a tendency to look for the silver bullet in fighting poverty. We haven't found one. I'm sorry to say that. But the good news is that there is a growing body of evidence. There are lots of things that work. There are some that don't work, but it's important to know it. And there are you know, new questions that, that keep arising and uh, research, research continues. Uh, and there, is, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of resources to uh, help people think about it. So just to conclude with, you know, from a, an individual perspective, if you are engaged in philanthropy, heart is very important. In, in, and I do believe that heart will continue to be important and has to be important in philanthropy. So our recommendation is to use heart and passion to choose the cause that matters to you. And I, I'm echoing Fran's word from this morning, actually, because there are many causes that are worth tackling, right? We can't really choose. But within that cause, use an evidence-based approach. And then in terms of the types of programs that one can support, we distinguish between programs that have an immediate impact, so implementing organizations that implement programs today and help the poor today. And then there are organizations that operate more into the sort of meta you know, system and in the longer term. So research organizations that figure out what will work best for tomorrow, or you know, advocacy organizations that, that work at the systems level. right? And both are really important. So our advice is always to have a philanthropic portfolio that, that includes both because they are incredibly important and really uh, complement each other. What really matters at the end of the day is to keep our focus on learning. Thank you. Thank you, Annie, so much. You've given us much food for thought. Just one question. Um, in this evidence-based approach that, that your, you and your organization has, how has, been, how has it been received by your peers, by other NGOs and stuff? Are they interested in knowing the results that you're coming with, or do they kind of 
don't want to know. What, what's <laughs> what, what, what's, it, what's it the reaction? Um, it, it really depends. So um, the movement has really, I call this a movement, well, this, this approach has really grown in the last 15 years. Uh, it was a new by any means, you know, randomized control drugs have been used obviously in medicines, but also in agriculture for a long time. But in the social space, you know, um, uh, poverty alleviation space, it has really started growing in the last 15 years. And I, things have really evolved in the last 15 years. You know, I described this sort of growing movement um, and, and th that's, been true, you know, uh, that's been true among non-profits, among governments, among funding organizations. There is a lot more funding going into generating evidence. Um, you know, 15 years ago, um, we had to convince people that, that it made sense, uh, that, that it was not, you know, unethical to, to do this. Um, I, have, I have these conversations much less often now. You know, organizations are more likely to come to us. Um, but still, you know, it, it's country by country, organization by organization, we need to, to have this, uh, this dialogue. But, but yeah, no, I think overall there is a lot, lots of interest and growing. Good to know. Good to hear. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. And good luck <laughs> with your good work. Thank you. Thank you.